This week, Spider-Man No Way Home finally hits theaters. Leading up to its release, I've been reviewing the Spider-Man films that I hadn't previously reviewed on my channel. This is part four, so we're talking about The Amazing Spider-Man. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your thoughts on The Amazing Spider-Man. This is a spoiler review, so feel free to spoil away down below in the comments section. Likewise, if you haven't seen the film, you have been warned. As I said at the beginning, I'm reviewing all of the Spider-Man movies that I hadn't previously reviewed. Thus, by implication, once this series co was complete, I will have reviewed all of the Spider-Man movies and you can check all those reviews out in this playlist right up here. With that said, let's get started talking about the backstory and to kick off this video, I'm actually gonna play a clip uh, from a video I did a couple years back on canceled Spider-Man movies. It is one of my favorite videos that I ever did. It's a little bit different from a lot of my content. So if you like this clip, be sure to check out that video. But essentially the backstory of this movie intertwines with the backstory of a canceled Spider-Man movie in that of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. So here's the clip. That brings us to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. After a trilogy of highly profitable films, Raimi started work on continuing his franchise. Multiple screenwriters were brought in to work on three new films. One screenwriter worked on Spider-Man 4 while James Vanderbilt worked on 5 and 6, which potentially would have been one continuous story shot back to back. Though at the time it was unclear if Raimi and his actors would return for 5 and 6. If not, these scripts were intended to lay the foundation for a reboot. Initially, Raimi had discussed wanting to have Dr. Connors turn into the lizard in part four, but eventually they settled on having the Vulture and Felicia Hardy, who may have been Black Cat or Vultress, as the two main villains with John Malkovich and Anne Hathaway in the roles. Likewise, there were plans and storyboards of Bruce Campbell as Mysterio for the intro to the film. Eventually, tension started to form behind the scenes because Sony wanted the movie by a specific release date, but Sam Raimi's highest priority was making a movie that he was proud of and reportedly he hated every version of the script that was turned in. Years later, Raimi would eventually tell Vulture, the media outlet, not the imaginary villain, I was very unhappy with Spider-Man 3 and I wanted to make Spider-Man 4 to end on a very high note and the best Spider-Man of them all. But I couldn't get the script together in time due to my own failings. And I said to Sony, I don't want to make a movie that is less than great. So I think we shouldn't make this picture and go ahead with your reboot, which you're planning anyway. So Sony officially canceled Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 and moved ahead with James Vanderbilt's story, which became Mark Webb's The Amazing Spider-Man. So back in 2008, 2009, Sony didn't know exactly what they wanted to do with Spider-Man. They just knew they wanted to do something with Spider-Man. So they started like doing development on Sam Raimi, Spider-Man 4, 5 and 6, as well as a Venom spinoff, as well as a potential reboot, kind of all at the same time. And sometimes with the same writers working on multiple different projects and just shuffling the people around a little bit. And this led to kind of an awkward situation where in January of 2010, four days before Sam Raimi, Spider-Man 4 was canceled, Tobey Maguire did an interview talking about all the things he wanted to do in Spider-Man 4 and how he was excited to try and deliver something new, fresh, and exciting. And does doing the two pictures in between prepare you to jump back into the giant machinery of uh, doing a fourth movie? Yeah, it's it's great. Also, I like the new and, okay, how do we, how do we press this? How do yeah. we make it more exciting, more fun? How do we evolve the character and make it a, a rich, story and how do I make it interesting for myself to go mm -hmm. do something else. I, I have fun with those movies, I really do. Four days later, the movie was canceled and very quickly they had a direction for this new film as well as a director for the film because they'd been developing it at the exact same time as Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4. Just days later, Mark Webb was announced as Sam Raimi's replacement. Six months later, Andrew Garfield was announced as the new Spider-Man. When the movie came out, it got good, but not great reviews. It certainly didn't get kind of the universal praise that the first two Sam Raimi films got. And then when it hit theaters, globally, it did solid numbers, though in the United States, it certainly underperformed compared to the Raimi films, but it, it, it was good enough. It performed good enough 
certainly to continue the franchise while at the same time not making nearly as big of a splash as Sam Raimi's first two films did. But what did I think about the movie? Let's get started talking about the good. And right off the bat, I'll just say this. I think that this is a good Spider-Man film with two great leads, but it also struggles to find a way to stand out and be unique in a way that fits the character. That's kind of my starting position on this film. I do think it's good. With that said, the best thing about this movie is Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone. I think that Andrew Garfield is by far the best actor to play Peter Parker. And what I mean, what I mean by that isn't that he's necessarily the best Peter Parker that we've had or this is the best version. He is the best actor playing the part. He is a world class talent uh, that can emote and be transformative in a very believable fashion. Likewise, I think Emma Stone is the best actress to play the love interest in one of the Spider-Man films, who likewise just has a world-class uh, charm, charisma, ability to emote in a way that is absolutely believable. And so when you put the two of them on screen together, they just have phenomenal chemistry. They just are great. You buy into the way they interact with each other. It doesn't feel like movie banter. It doesn't feel like movie dialogue. It feels like two people that have an actual relationship with one another, that care about each other, that have insecurities, that they have strengths, weaknesses, all that stuff. You buy into it. And really for both Amazing Spider-Man films, that's where Mark Webb really shines is that he makes scenes with characters that you believe in. When they're doing human things, you believe that they are real characters. And I think some of that's probably, he was hired after doing this movie called 500 Days of Summer, which is it's kind of this um, really nice little uh, rom-dramedy where you know, it's, it's kind of funny, it's kind of romantic, but it's about a relationship and it's highs, it's lows, it's deterioration, it's coming together, and it's very entertaining, very emotional, and you buy into the lead characters in it. They have just an interesting dynamic that feels human. And that's what this movie does really well, as, as well as the sequel, that you buy into these characters, whether Peter with Gwen Stacy, Peter with his um, aunt and uncle, his friendships, the his tension that he has with Captain Stacy, all of that feels believable, not like you're watching a comic book movie, but like you're watching a real drama while still being entertaining and fitting totally with the rest of the film. And some of where this is also coming from is that they went for a tone that's more grounded in reality. Obviously, we're watching a story about a guy that gets bit by a radioactive spider and gains powers. Obviously, we're watching a movie where a man experiments on himself and turns into a man lizard. So, not realistic when it comes to the plot overall, but it's a movie that doesn't try to be campy, comic booky, over the top, exaggerated. Like when you watch the Sam Raimi films, there's there's a little bit of hokiness to them. There's a little bit ham, a little bit of cheese in there. And that's part of the appeal and the charm, but it's totally consistent. So it's not a negative for those films, but they're not trying to feel real. A lot of the drama can feel soap opera -y, soap opera -y. And once again, I'm not, that's not a negative for those films. That's the tone they went for. And I think they, they nail it. But I think one of the things this movie does really nicely is it feels like it's grounded in, an, in reality, in a real time, a real place, but where exaggerated, crazy, wild, fantastic and amazing things happen. And it balances those really nicely. And going back to what I just said all about how much I think Andrew Garfield, Emma Stone are great in these films because you believe in them. And then you believe in the dinner scenes. You believe in the moments at high school with this kid that doesn't feel fully like he fits in. is getting bullied just a little bit. You buy into those moments. This could Those moments could work in a film that's not a comic book movie. That could just work as this kind of coming of age story about this guy trying to find first love while being raised by his aunt and uncle and his parents disappeared. And he's trying to find his place in this world. 
it works without being a Spider-Man movie. And I don't think you could say that about the Raimi films, about the soap opera side to it. It fits into the movie they were making, but it doesn't work in and of itself in that genre, whereas this could work in that genre. And I think that is one of the things that this movie does really, really well. And it's because it's more grounded the actors are so good and we're not we haven't even started talking about you know martin sheen being in the mix and all these other great actors joining in everybody's really good and because they're grounded it's able to pull out bigger and fuller emotions as you're watching peter deal with so much stuff as he's struggling with why did his parents abandon him with his aunt and uncle? How does he form a relationship with his aunt and uncle? The tension that happens with the teenage angst. Uh, he, he's struggling with obviously becoming a superhero. And then he gets, he's finding first love and then realizing that his girlfriend's dad does not accept the other side of who he is. You have multiple dads dying in the story. Dad's abandoning people in the story. And those are big experiences that can pull out emotions from us because it plays them very much actually as a drama, not as scenes in a comic book movie. So that's, I think, where Mark Webb did his best work in both of his films is that making me buy into these characters and their arcs in these films. You feel the weight of it. Kind of moving on to some other things I, I liked in, in this film. Spider-Man, when he's in the suit, he, he's quippy. You, you get every, he's always joking in a very Spider-Man-esque way. Uh, I love that a bunch of these Spider-Man movies, in particular the Raimi and Amazing Spider-Man films, treat New York as a character in the films that has its own identity and treatment. And if you've watched my previous reviews, you know I, I talked about how much I enjoyed the, the sequences in Spider-Man 1 and 2 where New York City comes to Spider-Man's defense. And you get that in this movie with the, the crane sequence that it's, it's, it's certainly hokey. It's the hokiest this movie gets. Uh, where Spider-Man gets injured and he has to get across town. And so one of the guys running a crane his son was saved by Spider-Man, so he calls up all of his buddies to move the cranes to help Spider-Man. It is hokey, it's cheesy, but it absolutely works for me. I totally buy into it. I dig what they were going for. And I love that that aspect of the film because it ties into the, the plot line of the police department is hunting down Spider-Man because he's a vigilante. But the city views him as their hero. He's one of them. He's clearly trying to help. So we're on his side. And so I, I like that dynamic that they put in. And it pays off nicely because of that. Also, we got a great score here from James Horner. It's following up Danny Elfman's score in the first two Raimi films. I don't know if you could top that because it's just like a group. That's one of the great movie superhero scores of all time. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man theme. If you're going to try and follow it up, I think this is about as good as you can do. It, it, it's heroic. It's big. It pulls emotions out. I, I just think it's a, a, a great follow-up without copying what came before. Also, this movie has maybe the best Stan Lee cameo. <laughs> A lot of the times he just stands there, gets a quip. This time it's like a whole little bit in the middle of a fight sequence. It's funny and it pays off really well. I actually did a ranking of all the Stanley cameos. If you want to check that out right up here, I'll try to remember to put a card. But that's this is one of my absolute favorites in this movie because it's so incorporated with everything going on. So when it comes to this movie, I think it, it tells a good Spider-Man story. Great leads, great grounded emotions. But I think it works better as that Peter Parker coming of age story, the romance, the drama, than it does as standing out as a distinct Spider-Man story. And so it does a lot of things really well. I absolutely think it's good. I do think it has some weaknesses, quite a few weaknesses actually. So let's move on to the bad. And I think fundamentally the biggest problem with this film is that they're telling the Spider-Man origin story just 10 years after Sam Raimi did it, 
And it struggles to find a good enough reason to do that. It struggles to find a way to stand out and add something new that fits the character. And so you get a movie with a director that's great with the character moments. The score is wonderful. The two lead actors, they're great. The script, it's competently put together. It makes sense. It flows. There's character arcs. There's setup. There's payoff. But in its attempts to try and find a way to stand out, be unique, add something new, I don't think what they came up with fully fits Spider-Man or adds all that much that's new. And it has to add so many things in that I think it diminishes the overall quality. So you add in all of this mystery about Peter's parents. And then you have this plot line about him becoming an actual vigilante, not just the superhero, but the vigilante tried to get revenge for what happened. And it also has to have all the normal origin beats. Plus, we've got the relationship with Gwen and her dad's chasing after Peter Parker. It adds all this stuff, all these layers that at a certain point in time, it just feels like there's kind of too much going on. Sometimes it's almost hilarious the way it goes to great lengths to do the same thing, but different. The, the pinnacle example of this is the, when it tries to do with great power comes great responsibility. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. But they can't say that, so they have to find a new way to say it. But your father lived by a philosophy, a principle really. He believed that, that if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. And that moment kind of summarizes why this movie doesn't get to the high heights of the first two Raimi films. It's trying to do something different when what was done originally was a great version of it. So all the changes are just not quite as good, not quite as efficient, they're clunkier. It's a great story, it's well told, but it's not the best version because it just has to be different for different sake, just like that line that he just said. So what do they do to do all this? They make it a darker Spider-Man story. So there, it deals a lot more with kind of Peter Parker's angst as someone whose parents abandoned him and he's living with his aunt and uncle and then there's tragedy in his life, his first love, he's angry over death, he's out for revenge, he's not accepted. It kind of has this angst that some of that works in the Spider-Man mythology and some of it just feels a little bit out of character with where they go with it, where he's actual vigilante. It's also the darkest Spider-Man movie. What I mean by that, is it's actually dark, like it's at nighttime, which doesn't, it's a character that's known for being playful, funny, lighthearted while having tragedy in his life. He's not someone known for like bright colors, not someone known for being in the dark shadows. And I don't know if some of the darkness, the brooding, the angst is because it was one of the post dark night comic book movies that was trying to kind of move more in that direction, more grounded, more angsty, and it was that, you know, Nolan effect on the genre, or if they were just trying to do something different and Raimi went campy, so they went serious and dark, but I don't think it fully complements the character, having everything at nighttime, having him brooding so much and out for revenge. Likewise, it decides to explore Peter's parents, which in a lot of ways is certainly in the mainstream, is an unexplored realm when it comes to the Spider-Man mythology. He's just raised by Aunt May and Uncle Ben. We don't know much about his parents. And this movie tries to resolve that. And so we go into the whole conspiracy about his dad's working for Oscorp and something's going on. So they had to run and clearly they didn't want to, but it was the best thing for them to do for Peter, for themselves. And so you end up with a situation where it adds all these new layers, but I don't know that it does anything to actually enhance the character. None of us were asking questions about Peter's parents. That wasn't like, man, the thing missing from the Spider-Man mythology is a conspiracy theory about Peter's dad in Oscorp. None of us were thinking that. And so it doesn't resolve a tension we had. It doesn't answer a question I was asking. It just adds new layers. And in a way that it's kind of like, 
okay, so now we have daddy issues because Peter's dad left him. We have daddy issues because Uncle Ben was his actual dad that raised him and they have their tension and then he dies. And then you add in Gwen Stacy's dad into the mix who rejects him and then kind of accepts him at the end but tells him you can't be with his daughter. So we have three layers of daddy issues with Peter Parker in this film. Once again, I think that's an, that's what's kind of wrong with this film or what doesn't work. Like I said, I think it's good, but what doesn't work is that I think it's a movie that's trying to find, how do we tell the classic Spider-Man story, but we got to do something new. And so it just adds on top of what's already there. It just adds layers that don't resolve anything. They don't fix anything. They don't make it better. It just makes it more convoluted because now Peter has daddy issues in three different directions. And we were all satisfied with his back and forth with Uncle Ben. That worked. In and of itself was satisfying. It had everything that we needed. We didn't need to add his dad and then Gwen's dad and all this other stuff. So it just makes it a little bit more convoluted and distracts from the most powerful elements because there's too many things going on all at the same time. Time. Other big thing you have to talk about with this movie is the villain, the lizard, or Kurt Connors, and he's okay. It does a good job of giving him a motivation, but it's a familiar motivation. He's the well-meaning scientist that experiments on himself and turns himself into a monster. Like Green Goblin. Like Dr. Octopus. Like, we've done this before, so it's kind of familiar. And, you know, he's, he's a little bit different, so there's some intrigue there. But at the end of the day, when it comes to the character himself, he's just not very interesting. When you go to Green Goblin, he's just so kind of flamboyant, over the top. Willem Dafoe is just chewing up the scenery that he's so fun to watch that performance. And it gave him a lot of time to be interesting and be intertwined relationships in Peter's life. Dr. Octopus, Alfred Molina, you see him as kind of this fun, kind of arrogant, married scientist. So you contrast that with kind of the monster that comes later. But once again, a fun, energetic villain. And Lizard just doesn't have that energy. It, the performance, all none of it really brings to life things the way that some of these previous villains had done so. He's just kind of like a serious scientist. Now, it's kind of one of the side effects of when you tell a more grounded story like this, you can't have a performance like what Will Willem Dafoe did in the first Spider-Man movie. You can't do that performance with the lizard here. So he's more serious and it, they don't replace the over the top performance with something equally entertaining or intriguing. So you have a guy with a good motivation. It's a different character but he's just not all that interesting at the end of the day. And then when you get his actual plot, what he's trying to do in the third act of like, wait, he's trying to like gas the whole city. What This is getting kind of weird and ridiculous <laughs> at this point in time. And so it just didn't, didn't add up to a plot that made a lot of sense. You could follow what he was doing. And it felt a bit like, you know, 21st century superhero movie escalation syndrome where Every comic book movie feels like it needs to top the last one. So you have to find some way to have a bigger threat for the whole city. So all of a sudden this villain is trying to like gas everybody out of nowhere. And so it, it kind of rings a little bit hollow when all of that stuff is kind of taking place. And they're trying to find a way to like have the whole city in threat so that the crane guys can team up with Spider-Man to help him out. And the whole police force is kind of involved. But at the end of the day... What you actually care about in that sequence is that Peter's trying to be a hero. He's finally partnering up with Captain Stacy, who's kind of accepting him. And then the lizard snaps out of it just a little bit to try and not die as, as the monster. A little bit of Dr. Octopusisms in there. And then the, the moment with the dad dying and being like, keep my daughter out of this. That's the stuff that you actually care about. All the urgency stakes for the entire city is empty, is meaningless. You care about the characters. Going back to what I talked about before, that's what Mark Webb got right, that you care about the people because they are kind of grounded in reality. The more comic booky stuff 
rings a little bit hollow in this one. Real quick before I give you my final thoughts, be sure to join me down below in the comments section. Share your thoughts on the amazing Spider-Man. Also, remember this is part of a series where I'm reviewing all of the Spider-Man movies I haven't reviewed in the past, thus implying I've reviewed a bunch of them in the past. You can check out all of those reviews in this playlist right up here. Also, once No Way Home comes out, I'm going to update all of my big, gigantic Spider-Man rankings. So for the next week, it is just Spider-Man like crazy on this channel. You can also check out that in this playlist right up here. In the end, The Amazing Spider-Man is a good movie with two great leads that excels when it comes to the character moments. But it struggles to find a way to stand out and add something new to the Spider-Man origin story that fits the character and doesn't just convolute the story. Overall, it's a B on the entertainment scale, a 7.5, and it is a movie worth seeing, but not a movie you need to rush out and go see immediately. If you like this video, you can check out the rest of my Spider-Man reviews right there. You can check out my Spider-Man rankings right down there. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.